I'm Eric Lifton from Mesh Architectures. I'm going to be very quick. Maybe we'll get a little chance to have some discussion after this. Um, so just uh, very quickly, just to start with the tech triangle map, courtesy of uh, Claire and Kate. Um, you know, just to orient uh, the three vertices being the downtown Brooklyn site that we've just been talking about, the Navy Yard where a lot of work has been going on as a public-private partnership for a number of years now. And then uh, on the left, the third vertex is in uh, Dumbo, where my office is, and we've done a couple things around there. And I thought it would be just be good to talk for a minute about a little, the short story, uh, short story was a long process, but I'll tell it shortly, of the of Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, and uh, it, which is somewhat analogous, and hearing again the story of the High Line, somewhat analogous to that process where in the 80s, the uh, piers were about to be sold from the Port Authority to uh, public, uh, private developers. And a group of people in the neighborhood got together and said, we really want to use this space for a park. They uh, struggled for almost 20 years uh, to get that uh, approved. And in about 1998, the city finally said, OK, we're with you on this. We can't really fund this as a New York City park, but we'll uh, give you some money to develop it and you know, capitalize the project. And then uh, you guys uh, will we'll, we'll start there. From that point, there was a public, uh, uh, well, an, a corporation, a not-for-profit corporation that was uh, run by the city that uh, created, that did the plans for the park, and it was funded with uh, sites for private development within the park. There's a little bit of controversy there that goes on to this day, but in general, I think most people feel that it, it's, uh, it's worked out really well. The park is beautiful, and the group that originally came up with the idea of making a park there in the first place has now become the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy, which runs amazing uh, programs there, uh, most notably for kids around the city who don't get to spend any time in nature for the most part and get to come there and learn about river ecology uh, right there by the East River. And so we designed this uh, Environmental Education Center, which is a building that used to be a DEP water testing facility. Uh, and uh, so kids come in there and learn about the river, and it's, it's a pretty great thing. Uh, another project that we did in the neighborhood is uh, also in Dumbo, and this is a, a media center. This was also started in the last couple of years of the Bloomberg administration. The administration wanted to create a bridge between the traditional film and television industries of the city and uh, the new media uh, industry that was burgeoning there uh, in the city. Actually, the original idea was not to have it in, in Dumbo. That happened as we looked at uh, real estate locations. But the idea is to create a bridge and create a new kind of, uh, of entity there to, to encourage new kinds of storytelling. And they uh, sent a, issued an RFP. This was with EDC, uh, Kathleen Oliver, Catherine Oliver in the, uh, museum, uh, the museum, the uh, Office of Film and Television. And uh, they issued an RFP. Uh, we were teamed up with IFP and won this competition, and the media center was then developed with uh, public funding and is now uh, maintained on its own. It's, it's a 20,000 square foot facility there. It has a theater with this continuous video projection that goes around it. Uh, it has classrooms. It has a, a workspace that's kind of partially co-working and partially people who come in and, and have somewhat uh, kind of residencies there, and they have startups doing all kinds of interesting stuff, and they have demo days, and those companies go on to get funded. It's a really nice kind of seed operation. They have like an incubator for media, new media there in, in Dumbo. So uh, in a way what's interesting is about these two stories is two kinds of public-private initiatives, very broadly speaking. One you might call private origin, where a grassroots group comes together, comes up with an idea, works really hard to try to get funding for this, gets the uh, government to buy into it eventually, uh, and then they work together, get some public funding, some private funding, build this kind of amazing thing, and then go on to, you know, hopefully a sustainable business model to fund it on an ongoing basis. The other one, the inverse of that, is the public origin, which is like the media center, where there's initiative, and this happened a lot during the Bloomberg administration that was very um, kind of proactive about creating different kinds of opportunities. And they say, okay, we want to create this kind of uh, opportunity or this kind of industry or this kind of entity in a certain part of the city. And they uh, issued an RFP. 
uh, people can come and, and submit to that, submit to the RFP, and then through, again, a combination of public and private financing, create this thing which then is, is again, funded and sustains itself on an ongoing basis if everything turns out the way we want it to. Um, and and that's, that's pretty much it. I want to bring up one more thing which I think is important to think about as we go forward. There's an incredible amount of, uh, you know, I've had my firm in, in Brooklyn now for uh, eight or nine years now, and so there's been an incredible amount of entrepreneurship happening there and really exciting things, not just in the so-called tech triangle, but off in Gowanus and other places as well. And one of the things that we've noticed as we work with people and doing various projects that we really need to have a public-private partnership is with the regulatory agencies of various kinds, the Department of Buildings, Landmarks, City Planning. Uh, there's not enough partnership between the entrepreneurship the, uh, companies and these uh, city agencies. And it's one thing for, for large companies like for our city that you know, they're very large projects with very long lead times with very huge budgets. And for them, uh, this is kind of, I mean, it's annoying for them too, but it's kind of the cost of doing business and they, and they, and they get through it. But uh, we work with uh, smaller entities, uh, you know, uh, families that own buildings that I want to do something interesting or own uh, development sites uh, who literally can't do projects because the hoops that they have to jump through are just too enormous or too impossible for a small company uh, to be able to deal with, and there's just really no process for them to participate in in order to get their projects done. And so these things actually don't happen. And, it, and I can only imagine it costs the city a lot of economic activity to not have any pathway for these things to get done. You know, there are a lot of uh, zoning restrictions, code restrictions, a lot that people kind of acknowledge are not really uh, sustainable, not really, you know, they can't really be worked with. but. Uh, you know, the process is so slow in changing them that it's just going to take years for that to happen if, we, if things keep going the way they are. And I think we need to really address this and, um, and find another way. I mean, it's, it's a joke in architectural circles that the DOB is a dysfunctional organization. But, you know, let's be serious about it and, and find a way to, to solve that problem. That's it. <laughs>